wife are greedy or selfish towards each other. Okay? Which is going to set up a really interesting discussion about what would a guy like that do if he had the chance to get 10 million bucks? Hmm. Very interesting question. Now, I'm challenging you to continue to pay attention to the reading of the story, not the listening to the story, right? Follow along with the actual reading so you can improve your reading ability. Here we go. That stood alone and had an air of starvation. A few straggling savin trees, emblems of sterility, grew near it. No smoke ever curled from its chimney. No traveler stopped at its door. A miserable horse, whose ribs were as articulate as the bars of a gridiron, stalked about a field, where a thin carpet of moss, scarcely covering the ragged beds of pudding stone, tantalized and balked his hunger. And sometimes he would lean his head over the fence, look piteously at the passerby, and seem to petition deliverance from this land of famine. The house and its inmates had altogether a bad name. Tom's wife was a tall termagant, fierce of temper, loud of tongue, and strong of arm. Her voice was often heard in wordy warfare with her husband, and his face sometimes showed signs that their conflicts were not confined to words. No one ventured, however, to interfere between them. The lonely wayfarer shrunk within himself at the horrid clamor and clapper-clawing, eyed the den of discord askance, and hurried on his way, rejoicing, if a bachelor, in his celibacy. One day that Tom Walker had been to a distant part of the neighborhood, he took what he considered a shortcut homeward through the swamp. Like most shortcuts, it was an ill-chosen route. The swamp was thickly grown with great gloomy pines and hemlocks, some of them 90 feet high, which made it dark at noonday and a retreat for all the owls of the neighborhood. It was full of pits and quagmires, partly covered with weeds and mosses, where the green surface often betrayed the traveler into a gulf of black, smothering mud. There were also dark and stagnant pools, the abodes of the tadpole, the bullfrog, and the water snake, where the trunks of pines and hemlocks lay half-drowned, half-rotting, looking like alligators sleeping in the mire. Tom had long been picking his way cautiously through this treacherous forest, stepping from tuft to tuft of rushes and roots, which afforded precarious footholds among deep sloughs, or pacing carefully like a cat along the prostrate trunks of trees, startled now and then by the sudden screaming of the bittern, or the quacking of wild duck rising on the wing from some solitary pool. At length, he arrived at a firm piece of ground, which ran out like a peninsula into the deep bosom of the swamp. It had been one of the strongholds of the Indians during their wars with the first colonists. Here they had thrown up a kind of fort, which they had looked upon as almost impregnable, and had used as a place of refuge for their squaws and children. Nothing remained of the old Indian fort but a few embankments, gradually sinking to the level of the surrounding earth, and already overgrown in part by oaks and other forest trees, the foliage of which formed a contrast to the dark pines and hemlocks of the swamp. So we are setting, think about it, we are where? Write down, where are we in this story? Middle of the woods. Notice the emphasis on trees. A big tree. Now, for those of us that know anything about ancient stories, we know that trees often play very important in those stories. What's one of the most famous stories about a tree in a garden where there has to be a choice to either eat from a piece of fruit or no? Some of you that went to Sunday school go, oh, that's one of the earliest stories of the Bible where Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, have to make a choice whether to eat from a special piece of fruit or not. Where? Oh yeah, in the story, a snake comes along and convinces Eve to eat from the 
tree and in the story the snake is actually the title of our story the devil and Tom Walker ah so see we're making another 3a observation Washington Irving is playing on a very ancient motif or archetype in other words Tom Walker decides to walk through the woods alone and now he's going to meet the devil right so here we go our meeting in the woods. Kind of a scary place, right? Here we go. It was late in the dusk of evening when Tom Walker reached the old fort, and he paused there a while to rest himself. Top of page 231. Top of page 231. To linger in this lonely, melancholy place. Melancholy, for sad. The common people had a bad opinion of it from the stories handed down from the time of the Indian Wars, when it was asserted that the savages held incantations here and made sacrifices to the evil spirit. Tom Walker, however, was not a man to be troubled with any fears of the kind. He reposed himself for some time on the trunk of a fallen hemlock, listening to the boding cry of the tree toad, and delving with his walking staff into a mound of black mold at his feet. As he turned up the soil unconsciously, his staff struck against something hard. He raked it out of the vegetable mold, and lo, a cloven skull with an Indian tomahawk buried deep in it lay before him. The rust on the weapon showed the time that had elapsed since this death blow had been given. It was a dreary memento of the fierce struggle that had taken place in this last foothold of the Indian warriors. Huh, said Tom Walker, as he gave it a kick to shake the dirt from it. Let that skull alone said a gruff voice. Tom lifted up his eyes and beheld a great black man seated directly opposite him on the stump of a tree. He was exceedingly surprised, having neither heard nor seen anyone approach, and he was still more perplexed on observing, as well as the gathering gloom would permit, that the stranger was neither Negro nor Indian. It is true he was dressed in a rude half-Indian garb and had a red belt or sash swathed round his body, but his face was neither black nor copper color, but swarthy and dingy and begrimed with soot, as if he had been accustomed to toil among fires and forges. He had a shock of coarse black hair that stood out from his head in all directions and bore an axe on his shoulder. He scowled for a moment at Tom with a pair of great red eyes. What are you doing on my grounds? said the black man with a hoarse, growling voice. Your grounds, said Tom with a sneer. No more your grounds than mine. They belong to Deacon Peabody. Deacon Peabody be damned, said the stranger, as I flatter myself he will be if he does not look more to his own sins and less to those of his neighbors. Look yonder and see how Deacon Peabody is faring. Tom looked in the direction that the stranger pointed and beheld one of the great trees, fair and flourishing without, but rotten at the core and saw that it had been nearly hewn through, so that the first high wind was likely to blow it down. On the bark of the tree was scored the name of Deacon Peabody, an eminent man who had waxed wealthy by driving shrewd bargains with the Indians. He now looked around and found most of the tall trees marked with the name of some great man of the colony, and all more or less scored by the axe. The one on which he had been seated, and which had evidently just been hewn down, bore the name of Cronenshield, and he recollected a mighty rich man of that name, who made a vulgar display of wealth, which it was whispered he had acquired by buccaneering. He's just ready for burning, said the black man, with a growl of triumph. You see, I am likely to have a good stock of firewood for winter. But what right have you, said Tom, to cut down Deacon Peabody's timber? The right of a prior claim, said the other. This woodland belonged to me long before one of your white-faced race put foot upon the soil. And pray, who are you, if I may be so bold, said Tom. Oh, I go by various names. 
I am the wild huntsman in some countries, the black miner in others. In this neighborhood, I am known by the name of the black woodsman. I am he to whom the red man consecrated this spot, and in honor of whom they now and then roasted a white man by way of sweet-smelling sacrifice. Since the red men have been exterminated by you white savages, I amuse myself by presiding at the persecutions of Quakers and Anabaptists. I am the great patron and prompter of slave dealers and the grand master of the Salem witches. The upshot of all which is that, uh, if I mistake not, said Tom sturdily, you are he commonly called Old Scratch. The same at your service, replied the black man with a half-civil nod. Okay, let's pause for a moment and write a couple of ideas down at level one. You've just met Old Scratch. That is to say, he scratches your name out on the book of life. You're dead. This is sometimes referred to as death himself, sometimes simply referred to as the devil, right? So we've got multiple ways to think about who we're speaking with now, the devil, okay? Jot down a couple of things that you want to point out about his description that sticks in your mind, and the conversation between the two. Uh-oh, what is that called when we have characters talk back and forth to each other? Jot down what we call it. What do we call that? Dialogue, right? We call that dialogue. Notice the exchange back and forth between the two. All right, here we go. What's going to happen between the two of them? If you're a good reader, you start to make predictions, don't you? Right, okay? Here we go. Such was the opening of this interview, according to the old story though it has almost too familiar an air to Page 232, last two paragraphs. That to meet with such a singular personage in this wild, lonely place would have shaken any man's nerves. But Tom was a hard-minded fellow, not easily daunted, and he had lived so long with a termagant wife that he did not even fear the devil. Ouch. It is said that after this commencement, they had a long and earnest conversation together as Tom returned homeward. The black man told him of great sums of money buried by Kid the Pirate under the oak tree on the high ridge, not far from the morass. All these were under his command and protected by his power so that none could find them but such as propitiated his favor. These he offered to place within Tom Walker's reach having conceived an especial kindness for him. But they were to be had only on certain conditions. Uh oh here come the conditions, these right? conditions were may easily be surmised, though Tom never disclosed them publicly. They must have been very hard, for he required time to think of them, and he was not a man to stick at trifles when money was in view. When they had reached the edge of the swamp, the stranger paused. What proof have I that all you have been telling me is true, said Tom. There's my signature, said the black man, pressing his finger on Tom's forehead. So saying, he turned off among the thickets of the swamp and seemed, as Tom said, to go down, down, down into the earth until he totally disappeared. When Tom reached home, he found the black print of a finger burned, as it were, into his forehead, which nothing could obliterate. The first news his wife had to tell him was the sudden death of Absalom Cronenshield, the rich buccaneer. It was announced in the papers with the usual flourish that a great man had fallen in Israel. Tom recollected the tree which his black friend had just hewn down and which was ready for burning. Let the freebooter roast, said Tom. Who cares? He now felt convinced that all he had heard and seen was no illusion. He was not prone to let his wife into his confidence, but as this was an uneasy secret, he willingly shared it with her. All her avarice was awakened at the mention of hidden gold, and she urged her husband to comply with the black man's terms. Avarice. Did you see the word? You might want to write it down. Avarice. What does that word mean? Greed. 
Greedy, avarice. To be avaricious means you're greedy, okay? You always want stuff all the time. When mama hears about the gold, she could care less about anything else. Dude, if we can get rich, who cares? So this is going to be a story about wanting gold, wanting stuff, about the dangers of being too avaricious. Here we go. And secure what would make them wealthy for life. Right, to be wealthy. However Tom might have felt disposed to sell himself to the devil, he was determined not to do so to oblige his wife. So he flatly refused, out of the mere spirit of contradiction. Many were the quarrels they had on the subject. But the more she talked, the more resolute was Tom not to be damned to please her. At length, she determined to drive the bargain on her own account, and if she succeeded, to keep all the gain to herself. Being of the same fearless temper as her husband, she set off for the old Indian fort toward the close of a summer's day. She was many hours absent. When she came back, she was reserved and sullen in her replies. She spoke something of a black man, whom she met about twilight hewing at the root of a tall tree. He was sulky, however, and would not come to terms. She was to go again with a propitiatory offering, but what it was, she forbore to say. The next evening, she set off again for the swamp, with her apron heavily laden. Tom waited and waited for her, but in vain. Midnight came, but she did not make her appearance. Morning, noon, night returned, but still she did not come. Tom now grew uneasy for her safety, especially as he found she had carried off in her apron the silver teapot and spoons, and every portable article of value. Another night elapsed, another morning came, but no wife. In a word, she was never heard of more. Okay, so an introduction to this story begins with, first of all, an introduction to the setting, then to Tom Walker, then to his wife, then to a conversation between Tom Walker and the devil, and now finally, the wife, who is going to, in her own desire, run off to try and find the money. What happens to her? She ends up, right... No longer ever being found again. So we pause now in our story. We'll come back to study again uh, here in a little bit. All right? Thank you.